Hello, good. good morning. Welcome to part two of our discussion with Orlando Patterson. So in part one, we were talking about the cultural profile of, Jam of Jamaican slaves and Igbo slaves. But Pro Professor Patterson, there's another peculiar story in slavery. Historians usually refer to slavery as a peculiar institution because slaves were considered to be property, but they could also own property. Jerome Andler, Philip Morgan, and other academics, and many Caribbean academics like Woodward K. Marshall have written on the internal marketing system. How did that work? How could people who were considered to be property own property? Um, actually, that's ancient. In fact, the Romans had a term for it. It's a Latin word. It's called the peculium. Peculium. And um, that is property which was in the possession of slaves. Now, the Romans who were great legal minds, you know, distinguished, made an important distinction uh, in which they referred to being in possession of something uh, as opposed to ownership proper. Um, slaves were allowed to possess property, but legally, ultimately, all property owned by the slave belong to the owner. The owner, however, allowed the slaves to um, be in possession of that property and at the owner's will may dispose of it. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the owner had the right to seize that property and to um, take possession of it when um, at, at will. And many slaves who accumulated property on their death, the owners would simply say, well, you know, this is the property of my property, therefore this is my property. So that is a simple legal device used. And um, owners found that it was in their interest to allow slaves to accumulate a little property, um, which in the case of Jamaica, they could sell in the Sunday market and so on. But, you know, in terms of the owner's wealth, this was chicken feed. Um, no big deal. In some cases, it did um, become significant, uh, in which case an arrangement was often made with the owner. Um, but this, this is nothing unusual. And legally, there's a simple device for taking account of it. It's known as a peculium. The peculium means that the slave was given permission to act as owner, uh, at the master's discretion and will. Simple as that. Professor Patterson, some years ago, UE published a small booklet titled Inside Slavery, Inside Slavery. And I, in it, there is a chapter, and one particular chapter reference to a report. And in this report, a, a, a white man was proposing policies to ameliorate slave conditions in Barbados. There is an argument that ameliorative efforts in Barbados occurred earlier, and this is one reason why Barbados was able to record natural increase. There's also another argument that planters in Barbados were brutal but more enlightened. What do you make of these views? Yeah, I like the, the second description. Brute, just as brute, all slavery is brutal. Just to think about it. Yes. Claim that you're in total ownership of another person. Can beat them, uh, that you own their children, that they have no right, uh, no marital rights, uh, no rights to their children or their ancestors. That's just inhuman. So there's never any doubt about any system of slavery of being other than humanity's greatest inhumanity to each other. However, yeah, enlightened, meaning enlightened self-interest um, often dictates to owners that certain kinds of policies would be down to their own benefit, um, which also benefits the slaves. So, you know, it's simple cap capitalistic calculation. Uh, and smarter owners knew one fundamental principle of slavery, that if you want the slave to work diligently, uh, you have to motivate them somehow, uh, not just the use of the whip. Um, you have to give the, you have to incentivize them. This is just normal human behavior. One of the greatest ways of incentivizing 
um, slaves is to promise them, to hold out the promise of manumission. And that is true of most slave societies. It is true of the Romans. It is true of the Greeks. It didn't mean that they're any less brutal. Uh, it meant that they recognize their own self-interest better than other slave owners. Now, in the case of Barbados and Jamaica, yes, I think the Barbadian slaveholders um, uh, had uh, more, were more attuned to their own self-interest, their own enlightened self-interest than the Jamaicans. The Jamaicans decided to rely on the whip and the whip alone um, uh, to, mot to motivate the slaves. The Barbadians were smart enough to see that, yes, they use the whip as the ultimate uh, mode of um, gaining obedience, but in their own enlightened self-interest, they recognized that um, you know, they could motivate the slaves in other ways. One was to um, create an environment in which um, the chance of the child growing up uh, they, um, was much better. Um, than the Jamaican situation. They saw that, hey, you know, we shouldn't just rely on the external source of support from Africa because ultimately this may be cut off. And what's more, it may be cheaper if we could motivate the slaves to reproduce. It's a simple calculation. It's a calculation which the Americans made also. In fact, they were forced to make it, although they started making it from before the end of the slave trade because the black population in America started reproducing from about 1720 or so. Uh, so that by the time you get to the middle of the 18th century, the majority of slaves in the US were in fact locally born. That became even more, that became a necessity after the end of the slave trade in 1807 when in fact the demand for cotton increased, uh, especially with the invention of the, um, the, the cotton gin, uh, after the external sources cut off with the ending of the slave trade. So they had no choice but to emphasize reproduction. So it was in their enlightened self-interest to do that. The Barbadians saw from relatively early um, that um, it made sense to create an environment in which they um, you, you have better reproduction, which, and, which is very simple. It meant feeding them better. It meant providing them protein, um, protein, more protein and so on. The Jamaican slave master were the most greedy, mean-spirited and brutal in, in, in the system of slavery. And they calculated that, look, uh, it doesn't make any sense trying to reproduce these kids because number one, you lost the labor of the, mother when she was pregnant you had to give her some time off no they didn't um, and they feel like they're losing money secondly they calculated that you know the the, the picnic the pickaninnies that they call as they call them uh, you have to feed them for several years before they are any use um, as laborers as a waste of money um, and so they were simply um uh, created an environment in which um, reproduction was not possible. They worked the women, the pregnant women, right up. They, they didn't offer them any incentives as they did in Barbados and the US, um, such as more time off and so on. They worked them right up to just a few days before they became uh, time to deliver. Uh, so there's a high rate of, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, miscarriages. They didn't look after the kids. They didn't provide any special thing for the kids. Um, their position was kids are a nuisance. Um, and so that's an example I'm saying of enlightened self-interest because when the slave trade was abolished and by that time Barbados was already reproducing, the population was self-reproducing. The Jamaicans then at the last minute in 18 after the slave trade, which they fought to the, you know, right to the end, they realized Lord of mercy, I don't, uh, the source of my supply is now um, no longer in existence. I have to try to motivate these people to pr rep reproduce, but then it was too late. So um, yes, there was greater enlightened self-interest, just good sense, which is another way of saying good capitalist sense, instead of the brutal attitude of the Jamaicans that, you know, we're gonna work them to death. And, uh, and then when they die, you just go buy another one. 
And that, so that was the system which led up to what I call a pattern of genocide, which I hope we talked about. All um, right. We're going to talk about that right now. Genocide. Yeah. Can we logically argue that slavery actually constituted genocide? Isn't genocide a political term? Shouldn't people committing genocide have it in their mind that that's their end goal to eliminate a group of people? Well, you can eliminate a group of people. You can do it deliberately or you can do it in the course of, um, you know, uh, extracting um, labor and, uh, uh, and uh, from them. Um, it doesn't matter whether it was, you know, it doesn't have to be like what the Germans did, which is that they just wanted to deliberately eliminate the Jews. And even then, by the way, the Germans did um, use the Jews in, um, in labor camps. I mean, people forget that they did. There's a long period, uh, especially between, uh, between about 35 and 40. And people have drawn on my books, Slavery and Social Death. Um, and um, to, to, to make this point that it, there's an earlier period of genocide in which they were working this, the Jews to death. Uh, and only after the war did they shift towards another kind of genocide, which is they just eliminate them, not in the course of brutalizing them, but just as a matter of policy. So in the case of Jamaica, you had a kind of genocide in which people were being eliminated in the course of brutalizing them, similar to what was going on in Germany with the Jews between about 1935 and 1940. Same thing, genocide, whether deliberate and the main reason are in the course of brutalizing a people. Um, and um, so um, the term genocide is a long, now there's a growing area of studies known as genocide studies. Um, and interestingly, as I mentioned, my own uh, work, Slavery and Social Death, has been used by one of the leading philosophers of genocide, uh, a woman who also wants to be a feminist theorist, and uh, 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 Claudia Card. Uh, Claudia Card, uh, um, who has used my, uh, my theory of social death um, to make the point that genocide involves both the physical extermination of a people and the cultural extermination of a people. Now, in the case of Jamaica, it was both. Uh, and also, a people don't have to be totally exterminated for genocide to take place. The Jews were not totally exterminated. You know, there are millions of Jews now in Israel and in, in the US and so on. There were, there were survivors. So genocide does not mean total extermination. Um, and, um, it, and as I said earlier, the motivation may be in the course of um, brutalizing. Uh, so my looking, using the Atlantic slave trade data, I didn't make this point in explicitly in the sociology of slavery, although I did make the point that Jamaica had the most brutal system of slavery. I already said that in the 1967 edition. But since the 1967 edition, we have this mass of data presented by the Atlantic Slave Trade um, Group, um, uh, based initially at Harvard, um, then um, it, it, in um, uh, in other institution. It's now, I think, at one of the University of Texas institutions. But anyway, this is just a fantastic amount of data on every ship manifest uh, of every voyage that took place. We now have, and they've now um, com uh, compiled a database on all of that, which is why we can speak more uh, accurately uh, about what happened. And so uh, I then um, went into this data and, um, and what I came up with and which I discussed in the introduction is the following. I compare, you know, I'm a comparative sociologist and usually comparisons usually allow you to make points which you can't just looking at one um, unit or one situation. So what I did was to compare America, the US, especially the US South, which is a slave society, I can make it, with Jamaica, okay? Um, and um, there's a figure in my, uh, in my introduction, which is very important, figure two, two which I want to look at, uh, which looks at the cumulative numbers. 
of Africans who were brought over to Jamaica and the US South. Now remember the US South is almost a continental, vast, huge area, okay? Stretching from Virginia um, uh, all the way down to south to Florida and southwest all the way over to you know Oklahoma. So um, between 1650 and 1830, the crucial period um, when Africans were coming over. Because by the way, some Africans did come over after the slave trade was abolished in 1807. How? Well, the British decided that once they abolished slavery, nobody else should have it, and so. The, 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 the Spanish were increasing their slavery in Cuba and Puerto Rico at that time. So the British ships, the British Navy would try to stop it by capturing slave ships. But instead of taking the Africans back to, to Africa, some went, went back to Sierra Leone and so on. But most of them, they actually <laughs> the, the part, the, um, placed them in Jamaica. A lot of them, by the way, in St. Thomas. Um, so. The period between 1650, let's say, which is just five years before capture of Jamaica, but let's use that as a starting point, and 1830, how many Africans were brought to America and how many Africans were brought to Jamaica? This first figure is staggering, okay? Remember, we're talking about the whole area of America. Um, only three, well, 388,233 Africans were brought in that entire period to what's now the United States, okay? 388,233. In the same period, the number of Africans brought to Little Jamaica, which is less than 1,000 the size of America, was 1 million, 17,109. That's the exact number we know from the ship manifest and so on. 1,017,109 Africans brought over to this tiny little island as opposed to only 388,233 over this entire period went to America. Okay, that's the first staggering figure. That is 2.6 times, over two and a half times as many Africans were brought to little Jamaica as, well, as were brought to the entire US of A, okay? That's number one. Well, here's the other staggering figure. How many Africans or people of African ancestry existed in America in 1830? Taking account, of course, of all the reproduction, you know, you, know, you brought these Africans over and they, this is a measure of how much they reproduce themselves. How many uh, people of black ancestry, African ancestry were there in the US in 1830 at the end of um, this period of Africans coming And how many of them were in Jamaica? Well, here's a stunning figure. In 1830, there were two, over two million to be exact, 2,009,048 uh, enslaved people in America. And if we take a, if we include free blacks, if we include free blacks, there were 2,328,442 black people in the US. All right? How many black people survived and were in Jamaica from that? 1,017,000 who came over. Okay, how many? Only 357,147. You begin to see the significance of this now? Do you understand the significance of this? Oh, uh, of course. The, 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 this is astonishing. What it amounts is that so here's the calculation I made. It's called a counterfactual analysis, but you don't, you don't have to um, get into that. Counterfactual analysis means you know, what might have been had something else happened. So had Africans and their descendants experienced the same rate of increase 
in Jamaica as ha happened in the United States, okay? Had we the same rate of reproduction, the Jamaican population, given the number, the over 1 million who came, had they reproduced, had the slave owners in Jamaica allowed them to reproduce at the same rate that the, that the slave owners in America, who were no angels, allowed their slaves to reproduce, the population in Jamaica would have been 5 million 262,522. And when you take account of the mixed uh, population, you know, all black people in the US had, uh, and the free colored in Jamaica, had Jamaica reproduced both as black and brown people at the same rate that America whom I again emphasize were no angels, allowed their black people to reproduce. There should have been 6 million, 90,499 black and brown people in Jamaica instead of that paltry figure of 357,000. That is my measure of the degree of genocide, okay? Um, the, um, so the, 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 the number of people who died, who should not have died, had we had the same rate of reproduction as the Americans did, the number of people who died, let's just take away, just subtract, right? The numbers who should have been there from the numbers that were actually there. The, the level of genocide, for me is 571, five, sorry, 5 million, 731 and 302, just, let's just say 5.7 million Jamaicans were missing, did not survive, who should have survived had the rate of reproduction in Jamaica been same, the same as the rate of reproduction in the United States with slave masters who were, as I said, repeatedly no angels, but who in their enlightened self-interest saw that it made, and out of necessity too, after 1807, saw that it made more sense to allow the black people, the Africans to reproduce. The Jamaicans said that made no sense. And so the number of Jamaicans who would have been in Jamaica had they not been brutally prevented from reproducing and killed off in the course of, um, of working them to death, the six million. Um, so the difference between those who actually survived and this six, over six million who should have, um, uh, you know, who would have um, been constituted a population had they just been a little more enlightened as slave owners was 5.7 million. That is the extent I'm saying of genocide in Jamaica. That's the actual figure I can put on it using this counterfactual approach. A counterfactual approach simply being a calculation based on what would have been had certain circumstances or certain factors been the case. And the, 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 the counterfactual here is what happened in the United States. That it, which was a similar slave owning society and um, just as racist towards black people as, uh, as, as the Jamaicans, but a little bit more self-interested and self-enlightened. And all the Jamaicans had to do, and by the way, as the Barbadians did, was to say, okay, let them reproduce. Don't beat the mothers. Don't let them carry the baby until the day they, they're, they're supposed to deliver with them in the fields. Uh, look after the kids. Take the view that it makes a little se more sense to spend a little money of your capital on bringing up the kids so that you have another uh, adult instead of relying totally on the slave trade. No, no, we're just gonna work the hell out of them, beat the hell out of them, get every penny we can out of them. And that was the 
strategy of Jamaicans. That was the <coughs> genocidal strategy, which in numerical terms amounted to 5.7 million Black people in Jamaica who did not survive, who should have survived, okay? I, I want that figure to be published because note something, that figure is almost similar to the total number of Jews who were e exterminated in the Nazi genocide. Our genocide in Little Jamaica was almost similar using this counterfactual approach to the Jewish genocide under the Nazis. That fact must be known. That's how we began, that's how our history began. That's how brutal this system was. It was a total system of violent savagery and exploitation that amounted to a genocide of 5.7 million people. That I, okay, um, I, I can't repeat that enough. Um, and, um, the, uh, and that, by the way, is not taking into account the other factor, the other element which the, which the philosopher of genocide, Claudia Card, um, emphasized that genocide is not just physical extermination or the prevention of the birth of people. And there are various ways you can do it. For example, if you force a population of all the women to be sterilized, that amounts to genocide, okay? Uh, what if you prevent a population from reproducing, that amounts to genocide as much as actually taking them and putting them in, in gas chambers. Um, the other point which Claudia Card, the philosopher of genocide emphasized is the cultural extermination of a people. And, um, you know, why we had a Creole culture, you know, the point is that African cultures were deliberately exterminated. We still have some fragments and so on, which we made use of in developing our own Creole culture. But there was, it goes without saying, a cultural extermination too, in that Africans were not allowed to reproduce, say their elaborate kinship system their religious traditions and so on. We had only fragments of that represented in the syncretic cultures of Kumina and so on. Okay, and occasional things like John Kunu and so on. But there was cultural genocide, but they're just as important, even more important. There was physical genocide of over 5.9 um, million people, 5.7 million people. I want that to go in the Jamaican history books. All right, okay. Well, uh, interestingly, Professor Prostration, I studied history at the University of the West Indies, and I did history, obviously, up to grade 30, because I studied it at UWE. And I can tell you that in the 60s, people like Douglas Hall, Pat Patrick Bryan, and even today, Beckles, they have written books. But the problem is how history is taught, that we have access to the new evidence. The, the issue is how the information is disseminated. Whenever people say that we need to decolonize the curriculum, I often say decolonize what? I have read the newer books and the newer books were introduced to me as a student. So what exactly are we going to decolonize? I think we ought to focus on training of the teacher so, they, so that they know how to disseminate the information properly. And on that point, you know, I, um, I am a little concerned about the reduction of the teaching of history directly and the fact that it has been folded into the teaching of something called social studies. Now, I'm a sociologist and you know, uh, believe that students should be aware of social issues and social conditions and sociological uh, and political issues, but not at the expense of teaching history. And I'm afraid the teaching of history is submerged and, um, and, 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 and almost, simply not taught enough. And, um, and um, I had a, I remember having a, a discussion with uh, Professor Shep Shepherd of the UWI on that point. And she's very concerned about the fact that um, the history uh, has been, if you like, uh, if not, not trivialized necessarily, but minimized in, under this rubric 
social studies. By the way, the same, in fact, this, this practice came from America. The Americans decided to um, develop this thing they call social studies in which history is embraced. And the original concept was not a bad one. It's the idea that you don't want to um, teach history just as facts, uh, what, um, you know, uh, one historian called facts and more damn facts, you know, and just knowing what dates and so on. Well, sure, that kind of history is the is the improper and bad teaching of history. Uh, proper history involves teaching the social issues to causes, consequences, and what have you. Um, and uh, and that kind of history teaching is needed. We have to go back to. Um, um, in fact, I would scrap the whole teaching of social studies and, in fact, go, go back to teaching history, teaching it the right way, not just a list of facts and figures, but also um, using history as a way of making points about, you know, the social origins of your present problems. And the prime minister last year made a very good point in his uh, you know, Emancipation Day speech. It really refers to the violence, and my God, the violence is getting worse and worse. I, I couldn't imagine it could be getting worse, but it's getting worse every day. Where does this come from? Um, uh, you may say, what, what, obviously from our history, um, it, and it's perpetuated in the way we treat each other, in the way um, um, we bring up our kids, we still think, uh, we use the lash, don't spare the rod and spoil the child, which is partly, in a sense, reinforced. Well, Professor Patterson, I have to share this anecdote. I was walking once and a young man, he fell and his father laced him with profanities just for falling. Children yeah. like that are, are, un are unlikely to become innovators. That type of parenting does not correlate with economic growth. Not just innovate. <laughs> But more importantly, to recognize the value of human life, recognize yes. dignity, dignity, recognize the need to be humane, recognize that when someone falls down, you don't criticize them, you help them up, and um, uh, just recognizing the value of human life, which clearly is not recognized by the killers, by the fact that people will shoot someone just because they say something uh, which they don't like. So, yeah, the way we bring up our kids. The way men treat women goes back to slavery um, and goes back to the colonial period. And um, so you may, people may say, but wait a minute, Barbados has a very low, to go back to our, our favorite comparison, Barbados has a low rate of, um, of uh, a, a low homicide rate. It's like one fifth out of Jamaica. Uh, last time I looked at it, it was like uh, something like 10.5 in 100,000 compared with Jamaica, which is 5,500,000. And it's perhaps gone up even more this year because the situation is getting worse. Now, so you may say Barbados are the same slavery, Barbados are the same colonial period. But you know by now what my answer is. Yeah, the institution may be similar, but the way they were executed was different. Barbados had slavery, yes, like Jamaica, but... Uh, as I just explained to you, Jamaican brutality was not just the worst. And by the way, I'm not the only one um, uh, who, who's recognized this. Um, this guy, Trevor Bernard. Yes, I interviewed him some time ago. Uh, yeah, he, claimed, he, he has already established that, uh, although he didn't make the genocide point, but he made a more economic point that the Jamaicans were something like 20 times more exploitative than the U.S., all right, so um, so the point here is that, yes, Barbados had slavery and so on, but Jamaican slavery was far more brutal uh, than anything in Barbados or anything in the US or anything in South America, except perhaps one or two little patches of South America, like in Brazil, you had a pretty brutal system on the coffee plantation, especially Vasarius and so on. But for me, Jamaican slavery is possibly with one or two exception. And I, this, here I get a little exotic. Um, the Laurian silver mines of fifth century Athens may take the cake in terms of brutality, um, as well as the Zanj, the slavery of the Zanj, which are Africans in ninth century Iraq. Those are the only two cases which approach 
the brutality. And I said, possibly Vasarius coffee plantation in Brazil in the 19th century. Those three cases are the only ones who come close to Jamaica in terms of the level of massive inhuman brutality in the history of the world. Yes, and uh, another point that I would like to make, and I will continue to speak about it further, is that when we talk about sl slavery in Jamaica and the Barb and Barbados, it becomes obvious that the parallels are not only economic, but also psychosocial. But I'm more of an economic historian than cultural historian, and yeah. I've recognized that Barbe because Bar Bar because Barbados was a bourgeois society, a more bourgeois society than yeah. Jamaica, even when people did not like each other, they knew how to interrelate with each yeah. other. So that's a big difference. So today in Jamaica, according to the World Bank, the private sector is not innovative. And the, even long before independence, the Jamaican private sector was what we call rent seekers. They were always complaining about government policy, they, they, the pr private entrepreneurs always required subsidies. It was just always lamenting and complaining. They're, ne yeah. they're never doing well. Yeah. Listen, I had some interesting revelations recently, a discussion with um, some business people in Ocho Rios. And, you know, we have this interesting situation now where there's a shortage of labor in the hotel sector and in, art and in construction. And I thought, this is amazing. When I was growing up, our big problem was unemployment. So what's going on? Um, yes, they may try to blame the workers, um, but I had this very interesting set of discussions in which a rather humane fellow, an Indian man who chose to live in Jamaica because he loved the Jamaican people. He said, Jamaica has been good to him. And he said to me, you know, this is nonsense about the lack of skilled people or the Jamaican's unwillingness to work. He said, that's not true. The simple explanation, he said, is that they're underpaid. Yes. And he gave me a very interesting metric, which, you know, I had not thought about that, but as someone interested in economics, you don't see the significance of it. Because one of the problems in comparing different societies and different economies is, of course, there are different contexts and so on. So how you compare? There are various ways in which we can um, control for differences in the level of development and so on. Like the economists use their famous uh, McDonald's. Um, to take the price of a McDonald's elsewhere. But there is um, a- Professor a, Patterson, so we're going to close this link, but we have to continue the conversation. So I'm going to send you a new one. Okay, well, <laughs> let's I'm going to close this out. And All right. Then, Okay. Because we have to continue this conversation.